arrested, thrown in the back of a Japanese cop car, and then driven down to a Japanese police station. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been thrown into a police station in my life. I've been like almost arrested maybe like seven times in my life, but I've never actually had the full on handcuffs uh, experience, uh, you know, back of the cop car, go into the, go into the police station, and I get put into an interrogation room. Guys, gals, and end pals, the following story is 100% true. I spent a year living in Japan. I had originally gone over there to teach English, as most people usually do when they're fresh out of college. I was a young lad and wanted to see Japan, mostly because I was a big retro video game fiend. And uh, while there, I got into uh, uh, crafting and performing electronic music. Uh, I was uh, a large fan of uh, electronic music and I was just doing it as a hobby at first and uh, while I was in uh, Japan I eventually started playing electronic music in uh, Japanese clubs. Uh, nothing big, nothing huge, they were very small uh, and it was a it was an area of Japan that was known to be quite dangerous because it had a large organized crime syndicate if you didn't know this, in Japan, there is a very large amount of organized crime that operates within Tokyo, uh, within uh, the city. Uh, and there's just a couple things you know as uh, a local or as a uh, tourist, uh, hopefully you've been informed of this, uh, to treat them with the utmost respect. Um, for the reasons of that they will sincerely fuck you up if you don't. Uh, a lot of the, the rumors about uh, the Yakuza, uh, some of them are true, uh, such as you will find, uh, and I know because I hung out with a lot of uh, early members, there's like a hierarchy you have to join in order to join those organizations, but a lot of them propagated the club scene in Japan. And uh, some of them would have, uh, at times, small amounts of, uh, you know, uh, a piece of their finger cut off because they'd had to do that as penance. That practice is not just an online rumor. That is true. Uh, e there's not a lot of people with tattoos in Japan for the very reason why it usually identifies you as being a part of a gang. Uh, that is uh, that is also 100% true. And uh, while working at a nightclub uh, in an area called Rapongi. Uh, we would have to work really, really weird hours. Sometimes uh, they would ask us to play music from 3 a.m. Uh, until like 8 a.m. And the genre of music they wanted us to play, which is not a genre of music I'm, uh, or I was a big fan of, uh, is called Psytrance. The reason they wanted you to play Psytrance is because Psytrance is very, very fast. It's got like, I think 100 and 50 beats per minute. It's kind of like but that's like the most popular form of electronic music there. Um, and uh, people would just basically uh, do what they called ice, which was crystal meth, uh, and dance to that music all through the weird hours of the day. I never did drugs in Japan. I'm not saying that because I often don't talk about doing drugs on the show, but I never did drugs in Japan. A, because I was incredibly afraid of uh, being arrested. The rules are, if you're a tourist, even with a working visa, and you do drugs in Japan, and they catch you, uh, they can make you uh, piss and uh, take a piss test, and then a result of that piss test uh, will see you kicked out of uh, the country. But before that, you have to spend two months in jail. You don't get a lawyer, you don't get to call the embassy, you don't get to do anything, you get two months in jail, then you get deported, uh, and then you can never return to the country again. That's pretty much the practice. So, needless to say, I was not trying nice, but I saw a lot of people doing a lot of drugs around me all the time, getting really fucked up. In fact, that's I, this is a bit of a sidebar, but that's the only time I've seen someone walk into a club with a giant bottle of uh, codeine cough syrup, like a massive bottle of it, like prescription codeine cough syrup, slam it down on a table, and then everyone just started doing shots of it. And I was just like, okay, all right then. Uh, yeah, j j have a time. I also, uh, uh, as another sidebar, once saw a fellow DJ who was doing the opening set before I played, blacked out on the floor with a needle in his arm and I was just like oh my god and that's obviously you know one of those opportunities where like I ran to, to go uh, call uh, an ambulance and the club owner was like oh no, no this happens all the time he's fine and just like picked him up and, and like, <laughs> like it's it's a wild scene too wild for me uh, let's be honest it's just uh, too too intense for 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 this for this uh, little tourist 
here's where the story starts. I'm working one night in the club, and all of a sudden, the door gets kicked in, and in walks the entire drug squad uh, of the local Tokyo police, as well as uh, the head chief, I guess, of the anti-drug league, and walks in front of the mall. Just like in the movies, they line up along the walls, all standing there, you know, incredibly intimidating. They demand, first and foremost, in Japanese, that the music shuts off immediately. I was playing at the time, so I turned off the music and just kind of sat back there and was like, what is happening here? And then all of a sudden, he starts screaming in Japanese. My Japanese has never been more than survival at best. I, I can say hello, goodbye, how are you, that kind of stuff. I was never able, I didn't understand a word of it. I just saw him screaming angrily and pointing at everything and everyone. And then all of a sudden, all of those police officers who were lined up on both sides of the walls just started ripping the place apart. Like, like not like shaking people down. They were shaking people down. People were full on having to like have all their stuff emptied out, blah, blah, blah. They were being put out. But they were ripping up seats. They were looking inside them. They were pulling out stuff. And contraband was everywhere. Obviously, people in there were packing quite a bit of stuff because, again, it had a very large criminal element. There was lots of Yakuza there. There was lots of people there. And just mass arrests. Arrests all over the place. The guy would not stop screaming. I had no idea. Like, I was I was just me and my friend who was, uh, who's also Canadian, uh, who came there with me. We were just, like, frozen stiff. And both of us were kind of like, what do we do? And then I was like, I guess nothing. I was like, I, like, neither of us have done drugs, so I'm not worried about that. I'm not holding drugs, so I'm not worried about that. But I'm also kind of like, are, are we, like, associated with whatever crimes are being committed here? Like, are we part of this this search and seizure? I'm not entirely sure what's happening here, but it looks looks to be pretty fucking intense. So, yeah, one of the, the more intense moments of my life. They end up arresting close to, I'd say, about 30 people. They arrest the club owner slash manager, uh, and he is, like, completely fearless in, in the face of all this. Um, he, he was, he was basically, you know, he was a very big dude and he's just got his handcuffs behind him and he just turns to us and he's like, you know, tell them nothing, tell them nothing. And I was like, I don't know anything. I was like, what? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I come here once or twice a week to play music. I was like, I, I was actually kind of upset that he said that because I was like, oh, I really, I really, I really hope that that's not going to implicate me into anything. Right. And he was just so fact about it. I was like, tell them nothing, tell them nothing, Lance, you know, be courageous. <laughs> You're just like, oh my god. Nothing happens to me or my friend. Like, the whole thing just starts clearing out. And we're like, oh, oh, I can feel my heart, like, exploding. We walk outside, and as soon as we walk outside, two of the cops are like, oh, them. Th those are the DJs in Japanese. And boom, arrested. Arrested, thrown in the back of a Japanese cop car, and then driven down to a Japanese police station. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been thrown into a police station in my life. I've been, like, almost arrested maybe, like, seven times in my life, but I've never actually had the full-on handcuffs, uh, experience, uh, you know, back of the cop car, go into the, go into the police station, and I get put into an interrogation room. I've also never been interrogated. I've never been part of an interrogation room. Now, it's not like the movies. It's not like it was super, super dark and weird in there. But there was definitely, like, a light that was, like, shining. That was, uh, you know, creating a distinction between the people who sat down in front of us. They made us wait for, I think, like, 40 minutes. And the two of us were interrogated simultaneously. They make us wait. And we're both sitting there. And both of us are so nervous. In my head, I just kept thinking. I was like... It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. There's nothing really. There's nothing that bad that can happen. You know, you're not really. You didn't have any drugs. You weren't associated with any crime or criminal element. You were just hired there to be a DJ. You know, like my head is racing like a mile a minute, kind of thinking. A guy comes in, sits down, and he speaks better English than I do. It was flawless, absolutely flawless. And he was definitely a good cop. And the bad cops just didn't speak once. You know, there was a couple other people who st who stood behind him. They didn't speak at all. They they just looked angry at me the whole time, like. But the guy sat down and just, wow, I was immediately blown away. And he's like, hi there. So, um, yeah, I recognize that the two of you, uh, it would seem that uh, you guys aren't uh, Japanese citizens. And like, how can you tell? Um, and we're just curious, what exactly were you doing there uh, at the time of the raid? And uh, we're sitting there and, you know, my, my friend is very, he's like shaking. He's so nervous, right? And then I don't know where this came from. I have absolutely no idea. But I went into full-blown uh, LARPing lawyer mode, like, in ways I've never done before. I, I genuinely, because he will ask me, and after the story is finished, he will ask me where this came from. I, I cannot tell you. But immediately it was like, 
I demand a phone call. I demand to speak to the Canadian consulate right now. This is an infringement of our rights. And then he's like, oh, let's slow down, slow down. No, no, I'm not saying that either you're in trouble. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to ascertain right now. Why exactly would you guys be there? Like, uh, did, 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 do you have any connections with, uh, did you, do you know where you were? Do you know who those people were? Do you know anything about that? I was like, I refuse to answer this. I, I, I demand right now that you provide me a phone number for the Canadian consulate at this moment. This is a violation of the Canadian Japanese Treaty of 1972. Completely made up, does not exist. I was just spouting bullshit at this point. The, the Canadian Japanese Alliance of 1972, this is a signed document. Once this reaches the news in Canada that you are holding, nay, detaining us against our will, you will be in so much fucking trouble. You will not hear the end. Like, <laughs> my buddy was sitting beside me, fully did that, like, looking at the ground, then. You know, like, thing where they actually, like, slowly, <laughs> and the guy was like, all right, just give me a second. I'm going to be back. They leave. About 20 minutes goes by. While those 20 minutes go by, he does, the, he did at one point do that thing where he, like, he turned over and he was like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, don't say anything. No, seriously, what the fuck are you doing? I was like, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Because in my head, I'm like, they're probably recording this. I don't know. I'm, I'm, everything I have based off at, at this point is movies. I'm, I'm, movies are the only thing that I I know anything about that. So that, so we're sitting there shaking. All three of them return. A very nice guy sits down, sits in front of us. This time he has water and puts a couple glasses of water in front of us. He's like, okay, so um, I'm not sure if we got off on the wrong foot, but uh, I, I just want to tell you that we're not uh, we're not charging you with anything yet. You're, you're, but neither of you are arrested uh, at this point. We, we understand, so apparently you're Canadian citizens. Um, I, again, I would just like to inquire what exactly you were doing there. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, after that, we'd like to inquire if uh, we can please get a urine sample from both of you. And the urine sample part, I guess whatever weird confidence I had going on there, just you know, twerked it into even more bizarre and strange. And I just straight up was just like, that is a violation of my rights as a, as a Canadian uh, under the, the rights of human rights and convention. Like half the things I'm saying aren't, aren't, aren't real, but I was like, under the treaty of human rights conventions, I do not need to surrender any bodily fluids, especially to a foreign entity. This is an agreement and a pact that was signed between Japan and Canada, and you cannot make us do it. This, when this reaches the embassy, like I demand now you give me my vote, like extra, extra like flipping out. And, and again, my friend is looking at the ground with that kind of like, what the fuck are you doing, Lance? And then the guy, very calmly, by the way, like nothing really like upset him. Just very calmly, he's like, I, I, "I'm just curious. I mean, if if neither of you have anything to hide, then then why exactly would you not just uh, you know surrender your urine into a small little vial? I mean, it's absolutely no problem. If you got nothing to hide, then I don't see why this is an issue. It, it, it seems unusual to me. Why you're becoming so defensive and angry? The I mean, ultimately, can you just provide your urine, please? Uh, and again." I, I go off gibberish, yelling, uh, bloviating, nonsense, none of it real, and the same thing happens again. Like, All right, gentlemen, we'll, we'll, we'll be back. They leave, they come back, he sits down. This time, he's got a giant book and a phone. And he's like, all right, uh, you would like to call the Canadian Embassy? Here you go. And so I'm like, okay. Flip through the pages, find the Canadian Embassy, dial the number, pick it up, phone, it rings, someone picks up. Uh, hi there, you, you reached the Canadian Embassy in Tokyo, Japan, how can we help you? I was like, uh, hi, uh, I'm a Canadian citizen, and, uh, me and my friend, uh, were just arrested, uh, we've done nothing wrong, uh, I'm currently sitting inside, uh, a Japanese jail, and, uh, they're interrogating us, asking that we, uh, provide them with urine, and uh, I, I, I'm just, uh, I'm curious what, uh, what can be done about this. The person on the other side, and I, I fucking, I kid you not, the person on the other side goes, "Oh wow, oh that's, that's serious, eh? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know. I, I think, I think what you need to do is, is maybe call uh, the, the other embassy. Uh, well, maybe call Canada." Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe call a lawyer in Canada. I, I haven't really dealt with that quite a bit. Yeah. And so I sat there and I was like, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Hang up the phone. So I just spoke to the Canadian Embassy. 
and they backed up every single thing I was saying. They said this is a direct violation of the 1972 Convention Treaty between Canada and Japan, that you have no authority to be able to demand or ask for my urine, that this is a direct violation of partnerships that have been built between these two countries, and if you do not release us immediately, they will begin to start the process of creating what could be one of the biggest international conflicts for you improperly detaining two Canadian students, I might add. They let us go. <laughs> they fucking... They let us go! I'm not... I'm not, I'm not making that up. Like, 100%. They let us go. And... I, I, I remember in the elevator going down in the police station. As soon as we got outside and we ran around the corner, my buddy grabbed me by the collar and goes, She's like, what the fuck? How, what the fuck? How did you do that? <laughs> He's like, how did you know that? I was like, oh, I, I, I was like, I, I made that all up. <laughs> like, none of, none of, I, there's no 1972 treaty between Canada. He's like, wait, what? What the fuck? What did the embassy say? And I was like, oh, the, the embassy said that we should call the Canadian consulate or something. I don't know. They had no idea what we were supposed to do. <laughs> they, they, like, the embassy was just like the, the, the completely helpless. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. You saved our lives. <laughs> He's like, you saved our lives. We would be in trouble. We would be in jail right now. <laughs> He's like, I smoked hash in China like two months ago. He's like, I would have gone to jail. And like, you could, you could actually see the like the beads of sweat that at different points in that whole conversation were pouring down both our faces, right? And don't get me wrong, I'm 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 not like a, a savant or anything like that. Where I was, I was just like, okay, here's the moment. Here's exactly what you need to do, Lance. If you had seen my feet, which I'm sure they could have seen. My foot was going like this. I was, I was, I was like this. I was like trying to keep my upper body stiff, but I was certainly like this the whole time. And both of us had our like our hands clenched. Like there was like I could feel sweat pouring from every like side of my body, just sitting there. And I was like, oh my god, I'm gonna go to jail. I'm, I'm gonna go to jail right now. And there's nothing I can do about it. I'm about to go to prison because goddamn, there's nothing I can do in this situation. And yeah, I I, li I lied my way out of uh, going to Japanese jail after being <laughs> interrogated uh, by the drug squad. Uh, and yeah, uh, my my boss or whatever you want to call him just bribed his way out of there. Like we saw him a week later, and he's like, "Oh, hey guys," and we were like, "What the fuck?" Because <laughs> like, if anyone was gonna take the fall for that, I assumed it was you. And he's like, oh no, no, it's happened before. He's like, it's just, it just costs more this time. I'm just, it just cost more. What? Uh, okay. All right. Fine. That, that's a, that's that, that's a hell of a thing. But there you are, uh, Cheeto. Uh, thank you for the the forty gifted subs. It, it, it's literally, I, I'm, I, I'm, I apologize. It's, it's probably the best story I have. Uh, I, I've never, I, I have never been in a more intense situation with the law. Is this person still friends with you? Yeah, we're still besties. <laughs> we're still, we're still really good friends. He's, uh, he's, he's, he, I mean, it's a story that, like, we told to everyone I know right after it happened. Like, I, I remember as soon as I got home, I told it to my parents. I, t I told it to my mom. <laughs> like, I, I, I think I called my parents first and foremost, like, you know, still shaky. Still, still like this, and just like, oh, hi. It's like, oh, son, how's it going? How, how's life in Japan? <laughs> I was like, well, mom, I have, I have a story for you. Um, did I go back to work for him? Yeah, we did actually, <laughs> because no one else, no one else would hire us in that small town. Um, but also, uh, it turns out that that's a regular thing. I found out that they do. It's, it's kind of like a, a cyclical cycle. They have a very low amount of uh, drug problems uh, in Japan, and they have a very low rate of crime in Tokyo because uh, they have an incredibly high rate of conviction. Like, it's, it's an unbelievably high rate of conviction. Uh, it's, it's something like, it's weird. It seems artificially inflated or something like that. But, um... Yeah, he was, he was like, this is just something that happens. He's like, oh yeah, he's like, the drug squad comes in all the time, they arrest like four Yakuza members, they they, they seize a bunch of like drugs or something. He's like, I pay them, you know, a uh, couple hundred thousand yen, uh, and then uh, they, they release me, and then a couple of the, the members uh, will either, uh, they try to get them to flip on higher members, which they never do because everyone's fiercely loyal, so they might just imprison a couple of them for a period of time. Uh, they torture people into confessing, Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why there's such a high conviction rate. Oh, man. Yeah. It's in the 90% wise. Yeah, that's what they told me. It's like 
Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, so bear in mind, never, never underestimate the power of bullshitting with righteous conviction and condemnation being the only strength behind your bullshit. Cause that's, that's, that's all I had. It was a Hail Mary of the highest Hail Mary degrees. I've, and I, I, I have not succeeded at, at, at that in anything else, I think, <laughs> since to that, to that degree. But why did you go this route when you didn't think you had drugs in your urine? Um, because I had no, I, I, I thought we were guilty by association. I, I thought because I was a hired by the manager, I was in the club. Uh, I was, I was like in, like, I thought I was part of the crime scene. I don't know. I, I've, I've only seen movies about this shit. I, uh, the one thing I did know is that I had such little rights. I was like, if I get arrested, uh, and, uh, convicted or whatever, then they put me in jail for two months and get deported. That's the, that was something that was taught to us not only by, uh, like the school that I was working for. It was like, by the way, if you ever find yourself, you know, trying to do something legal in Japan, don't, uh, because you can be arrested and, and held in a jail for two months without a lawyer or anything, not even a call to the embassy, then they release you and deport you and you just never come back. And I was like, I, I have to avoid that scenario at all costs. Um, yeah. I, I yeah, I, I don't know. Fear is probably the better answer. Uh, utter and complete fear and, and paranoia and, and 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 severe like what is going to happen. Uh, super white privilege. Okay, I well I would normally agree with you in any other scenario. I don't know if you've heard this part of it, Comrade Homer, but Japan was the only place with this flip. So my friend who's in this story, uh, his family is originally from Korea. Uh, so. I would get stopped on the streets. Uh, this is another reason I never did drugs. I would get profiled and stopped on the streets all the time. I think we counted close to nine or ten times by the time our trip was over, where the cops would stop both of us and they would just search me. And and the reason being is that they have a really huge problem in Japan with people who are American and white, uh, especially GIs, doing horrifying things in Tokyo. Like they had a lot of problems with Americans from American bases, uh, both like sexually assaulting women and uh, uh, physically assaulting like taxi drivers and like physically assaulting people in bars. So they were, if you want to say racially profiling, uh, me for whiteness and doing uh, stop and searches on me. And my friend loved it. He would like by the fifth one, he was bursting out laughing every single time because he knew what was going to happen. Because you walk down the streets and the cops would be like, oh, excuse me, sir, random security check. They'd have to check like, you know, my Japanese visa. They'd have to, they'd make me pull out all of my pockets pull out all that stuff it was uh yeah anyways that's that's the japan story you can you can uh now go forth and make fun of me adequately i got a new job so i could drop 100 subs and get the story and i missed it <laughs> well you get you get it for free and you get to rewind it and a special thanks i guess to cheeto for gifting uh 40 subs and, and making that possible and uh yeah i i have not spent a single day in a japanese jail cell only in the uh only in the interrogation room Thanks to all that. Do you enjoy the surfs, but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form. Available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free. Just like the podcast. To our gods, Xander Corbis and Peyton L. Just, we are prepared to embark on a mighty jihad in your name. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble jester, attempting in vain to get you to laugh. To our valiant knights of the round table, Benji Arnie, Tech Tink, Scary Earth Human, Tony, DM Rivera, Resident Scarecrow, Sir Nickus, Mayred, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruby Kelly, Brandon, Words Greenwood, It doesn't matter what I believe, it only matters what I can prove. Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Jenna Tao, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multimondi, Trevbot, EXE, Brian Ephraim, Lemmy101, Anthropophojack, Saren42, Catherine, Ramon Acosta, Incosin, Agent NDN, Violent Orchard, Political Puppy, La Media Panza, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We raise our mugs and salute our brave heroes off to another glorious conquest.